The anime begins by showing two workers from Shoshidai descended into the dark and ominous cave. They knew that their mission was a dangerous one. They were searching for the legendary demon sword Zoltguin, a cursed weapon said to be made of demon blood and capable of granting great power to its wielder. But the workers knew that such power came at a great cost, and they were determined to retrieve the sword before it fell into the wrong hands. Meanwhile, on a train heading towards the cave, Administrator Miura and Ichijo Seiya were making their own plans to get their hands on the demon sword. Ichijo, who knew Miura's ambition all too well, warned his companion to be careful and not let his greed for power consume him. For if Miura were to carelessly wield the sword, he too could fall victim to its curse and become a demon himself. As the two men approached the cave, they could only wonder what dangers and challenges awaited them within its depths. As the two Shoshidai workers delved deeper into the cave, one of them began to recount a dark and troubled history. He spoke of a time when the Roman area was under attack by brutal barbarians, who slaughtered anyone in their path. Desperate for help, a priest in Rome prayed to God for salvation, but his prayers went unanswered. In his desperation, the priest turned to the devil, begging for intervention. The devil, seeing an opportunity to sow chaos and destruction, answered the priest's prayer by sending a skeleton knight wielding the demon sword Zoltguin. With the cursed weapon in hand, the knight slaughtered not only the barbarians, but also the innocent villagers of Rome. And so, the demon sword Zoltguin became a cursed and feared weapon, its power sought by those willing to risk their own souls to wield it. As the two Shoshidai workers continued their search, they finally caught sight of the demon sword Zoltguin, glowing behind a wall held by a glowing statue. But as they approached to retrieve it, they were interrupted by the arrival of Miura and Ichijo, who had come seeking the sword for themselves. A fierce gun battle erupted as the Shoshidai workers fought to protect the cursed weapon. But in the chaos, Miura saw an opportunity to seize the sword for himself. He commanded Ichijo to take the demon sword Zoltguin, and with a swift and precise throw of his disc, Ichijo struck the neck of one of the Shoshidai workers and retrieved the sword. With the demon sword in hand, Ichijo quickly made his way back to Miura's headquarters, where he was greeted with praise for his swift and efficient completion of the task. And so, the demon sword Zoltguin, with all its dark and dangerous power, came under the control of Miura and his organization. As Ichijo prepared to leave the headquarters, Miura expressed his hope that they would work together on another mission in the future. However, Ichijo was not so sure. He had plans to take a long and much-needed rest, and he was not sure if he was ready to take on another dangerous assignment so soon. Several years passed, and the demon sword Zoltguin remained in the hands of Miura and his organization, Shoshidai. But their possession of the cursed weapon did not go unnoticed. A group of Shoshidai officers laid siege to a cruise ship, searching for a man rumored to be in possession of a cursed sword. As the officer surrounded the man, he pretended to give up his weapon, but as they reached for it, he pulled out a gun and tried to fight back. His efforts were in vain, however, as the officers quickly overpowered him and shot him down. But as he lay dying, the cursed sword released a burst of flames that set the cruise ship ablaze, causing it to explode in a massive fireball. The demon sword Zoltguin had claimed yet another victim, and its dark power seemed to know no bounds. As Miura approached the chamber where the demon sword Zoltguin was kept, he could feel an ominous energy emanating from the room. Despite his misgivings, he entered and approached the storage tube that held the cursed weapon. As he touched the hilt of the sword, he was immediately consumed by its dark power, transforming him into a demon bent on destruction. In another part of the city, a group of people had gathered at a temple to perform a ritual to purify the Shiryu sword, which had been tainted by an evil aura. The man leading the ceremony began by drawing a small amount of his own blood and dripping it onto the Shiryu sword, which was wrapped in a white cloth. As the blood touched the blade, the cloth began to glow with a powerful, magical energy. It was as if the sword had come alive, drinking in the blood offering and using it to rid itself of the darkness that had contaminated it. As the ritual to purify the Shiryu sword reached its climax, something went horribly wrong. The man leading the ceremony, overcome by the sword's malevolent energy, was possessed by the weapon and began a rampage, slaughtering everyone in the temple. Takashi and his pregnant wife Wakaba were returning home from a shopping trip when tragedy struck. As Wakaba walked ahead, Takashi was attacked by the ritual leader, who had been possessed by the Shiryu sword. Despite his best efforts, Takashi was no match for the man's supernatural strength and was killed. When the ritual leader came to his senses, he was horrified to find that he had taken a life. Haunted by the memory of what he had done, he fled the scene, unsure of where to turn or what to do next. In the aftermath of her husband's death, Wakaba seized the opportunity to take possession of the Shiryu sword. However, she was unaware that the weapon was still contaminated by an evil power, and as she touched it, she too was possessed by its darkness. Fueled by grief and rage, Wakaba turned on the ritual leader who had killed her husband, unleashing the full force of the Shiryu sword's malevolent energy against him. 
Meanwhile, on the streets of the city, Miura, possessed by the demon sword Zoltguin, was confronted by a squad of Shoshidai troops who tried to persuade him to surrender. But Miura, consumed by the sword's power, refused to give in and instead unleashed a barrage of flames from the Zoltguin's blade, attacking the soldiers with reckless abandon. As Miura rampaged through the city, another figure appeared on the scene, wielding another cursed sword. This man, a skilled swordsman, challenged Miura to a duel, and both men transformed into Busoma, powerful demon warriors locked in combat. Despite the man's skill, he was no match for Miura, who easily defeated him before disappearing into the night. That same evening, a swordsmith named Amon was walking through the forest when he came upon a shocking sight, Wakaba, hanging from a tree, her life cut short by her own hand. Nearby, he noticed a baby boy holding the Shiryu sword, and feeling compassion for the child, he brought him back to his home. Years passed, and the baby boy grew into a young man named Gaiogata. One day, as she was having lunch with two friends in the park, they asked her to join them for karaoke. But Sayaka refused, citing her busy schedule. Her friends also questioned her decision to turn down Otsuka, who had recently confessed his love for her. Upon hearing her friend's question about Otsuka, Sayaka smiled and explained that she simply didn't have time for dating at the moment. After school, she met up with a young man named Guy and invited him to the karaoke place her friends had mentioned during breaks. However, Guy declined, stating that he was busy forging swords, which frustrated Sayaka. She tried to interfere with his work, but was quickly interrupted by the arrival of Tatsumi, who scolded Guy for not focusing on his work. Though Sayaka tried to take the blame for the interruption, Tatsumi apologized to Guy and took responsibility for the situation. Just then, Aman appeared to break up the argument and reminded Sayaka, whom he considered his daughter, that she had a duty to prepare to become a priest by cleansing the Shiryu sword. Before proceeding with the ritual, Aman took Guy to a hill where his mother was buried. There, he asked Guy about his plans for the future, now that he was old enough to determine his own path. Guy admitted that he had no particular goals, and begged Amon to allow him to stay at his home and become a sword maker. Meanwhile, Naoki Miki, a member of the Shoshidai on a mission to obtain the Azoth sword, was attending an auction in search of the legendary weapon. As he approached the glass case where the Azoth sword was displayed, he carefully examined it, confirming its authenticity. As Miki admired the Azoth sword, he was approached by Marcus Lithos, who also had his eye on the weapon. Marcus explained that he hoped to use the sword to cure his paralysis, and told Mickey about the legend of the Azoth sword. According to the story, the alchemist Paracelsus had made a pact with the devil, selling his soul in exchange for the knowledge to create the Philosopher's Stone. But when Paracelsus broke his promise, the demon he had summoned was sealed within the stone, which was then embedded in the Azoth sword. Back at Amon's house, Tatsumi stumbled upon Guy in the sword storage room as he was preparing to perform the sword cleansing ritual. Tatsumi, who disliked Guy, went to speak with Amon and informed him of what he had seen. Amon explained that Guy had been chosen to give his blood to cleanse the Shiryu sword, which was why he had been in the storage room. However, Tatsumi remained skeptical and unconvinced, expressing his frustration that Amon would trust Guy with such an important task. He revealed that Guy had been found in the forest as a baby, holding the Shiryu sword in his hand, and he still couldn't accept the fact that Guy had been chosen for this role. Determined to prevent the sword cleansing ritual from taking place, Tetsumi began to plot. The following night, as everyone gathered to perform the ritual to cleanse the Shiryu sword, the room was filled with a sense of anticipation. To avoid being affected by the sword's evil power, everyone in the room was blindfolded, except for Sayaka, who was to serve as the priestess for the ceremony. As Sayaka entered the ritual room, she made her way over to Guy, who was preparing to cut himself to offer his blood to the Shiryu sword. But before the ritual could be completed, Tatsumi, filled with jealousy and resentment towards Guy, removed his blindfold and summoned a demonic figure to possess and control Sayaka. The demon-possessed Sayaka turned on Tatsumi, intent on killing him. Guy, who had witnessed Tatsumi's actions, tried to intervene and protect Sayaka, but his efforts were in vain. In the struggle, Guy was struck by the Shiryu sword and lost his right arm. A week later, Sayaka remained concerned about Guy, who was suffering from severe, incurable pain. Feeling compassion for Guy's suffering, Amon went to the room where the Shiryu sword was kept and spoke to the weapon, imploring it to protect Guy. After making his plea, he set to work forging the Shiryu sword into a new arm for Guy, determined to ease his pain. Meanwhile, at the auction venue, a large crowd had gathered to bid on the Azoth sword. Mickey and Marcus were seen competing fiercely for the weapon, and in the end, it was Mickey who emerged victorious, placing the highest bid and securing the Azoth sword. He contacted Kyoka Kagami to inform him of his success and promised to bring the sword back to the Shoshidai headquarters as soon as possible. As Miki made his way back to the Shoshidai headquarters with the Azoth sword, he was ambushed by Marcus and his men, who sought to take the weapon for themselves. 
Mickey was forced to defend himself, drawing his falcon sword to fight off the attackers. Just then, Miura appeared on the scene, wielding the powerful Zoltgun sword. Despite being warned by Kyoka to run away, Mickey bravely stood his ground and fought Miura, determined to protect the Azaw sword. Back at Amon's house, Guy was startled to wake up and find that his missing arm had been replaced by an iron prosthetic made from the Shiryu sword. He gazed at the weapon in wonder, grateful for the unexpected gift that would allow him to continue his life as a sword maker. As the battle between Mickey and Miura raged on, with Miura having transformed into a powerful Basoma, Mickey found himself overwhelmed by the strength of the Zoltgun sword. Desperate to escape, he retreated to his car and made a hasty getaway. However, as he drove away, he realized that the Azov sword had been stolen by Marcus, and he was now empty-handed. The next morning, Guy paid a visit to Amon to ask about the Shiryu sword that had been forged into his new arm. Amon explained that the weapon had been Guy's protective sword at birth, and now it would serve as his right hand and full protector. Guy listened in silence, grateful to Amon for the gift that had been given to him. As Sayaka met up with Guy, who had fully recovered from his injuries, she felt a great sense of relief and joy. Guy told her about Amon's decision to destroy the Shiryu sword in order to create his new arm, and Sayaka understood that it was a testament to Amon's love and desire to protect him. Later that afternoon, as Tatsumi was escorting Sayaka home from school, he grabbed her forcefully and pulled her into the forest they were passing through. There, he revealed that he had feelings for her and planned to kidnap her out of spite towards Amon, whom he resented for choosing Guy as the successor to the Shiryu sword. As Tatsumi threatened Sayaka, Guy arrived just in time to save her. However, the sight of Tatsumi made Guy furious, and he was possessed by the evil power of the Shiryu sword. He ordered the demon within the weapon to kill Tatsumi, who looked terrified at the prospect of facing a possessed Guy. But Sayaka's cries for Guy to come back to his senses managed to snap him out of the possession before he could harm Tatsumi. Guy was frustrated by the constant urging of the Shiryu sword to kill, and he retreated to a room in Amon's house, where he hid his head in an attempt to silence the weapon's commands. From then on, he made the decision to destroy the hand made of the Shiryu sword, determined to rid himself of the weapon's evil influence. As Sayaka caught up with Guy and hugged him, pleading with him not to harm himself, the voice of the Shiryu sword suddenly disappeared, leaving Guy in peace. At the same time, Tatsumi had been possessed by the power of a demonic spear, driven by his envy of Guy. He knocked Sayaka unconscious and began to attack Guy, unleashing his demonic powers against him. Guy struggled to hold back, aware of the Shiryu sword's urging to kill and determined not to be controlled by its evil power. But as the battle raged on, the sword's strength began to overtake him, and he found himself fighting Tatsumi in the forest, caught up in the weapon's deadly influence. Amon, sensing the bloodthirsty aura of the Shiryu sword, left the room in search of the source of the energy. To his surprise, he found Sayaka unconscious in one of the rooms of his house. Meanwhile, the fight between Guy and Tatsumi continued, unbeknownst to them that they were being watched by a Shoshidai helicopter hovering above the forest. Back at the Shoshidai headquarters, Kyoka and Marcus received news of a chrysalises and Basoma fighting in the forest. However, Kyoka found it strange that the chrysalises, Guy, appeared to have the upper hand against the typically more powerful Basoma. Tatsumi, who had begun to transform into a Basoma, found himself overwhelmed by Guy's strength and decided to flee. Meanwhile, Guy spotted the Shoshidai helicopter watching him and attacked the aircraft before returning to Amon's house. Upon arriving there, he was met by Amon, who had managed to save him from hurting himself as the evil power of the Shiryu sword had taken hold of him. With the demon's influence neutralized, Guy returned to his normal self. The next day, Sayaka noticed something strange about Guy, he seemed to have regressed in age, appearing more like a baby. Amon, upon receiving Sayaka's report, suspected that the power of the Shiryu sword had merged with Guy causing him to seem reborn. Meanwhile, Tatsumi, who had fully transformed into a Basoma, hid in the forest and attacked any animals or people who happened to pass by. That night, Kigetsu brought Ichijo to see Amon, seeking the truth about the making of the Shiryu sword. Amon explained that according to legend, the Shiryu sword was forged from a dragon. Not long after, Ichijo met with Guy and invited him to come to the Shoshidai headquarters, hoping that it would help him discover his true identity and the fate that awaited him. Guy accepted the offer, and they set out on their journey to the Shoshidai headquarters. Along the way, Ichijo took the time to meet with his girlfriend Kei, and have lunch at her house. Guy was surprised to see that Ichijo's girlfriend was much older than him, and he asked about this. Ichijo explained that he was a chrysalis, possessed by the power of a cursed weapon that would eventually transform him into a basoma. To delay the transformation into a basoma, chrysalises must be frozen and placed in a state of sleep. They are then guarded until they are needed and awakened when their power is required. Ichijo told Guy that he had slept for 16 years, and during that time, his body was frozen, causing him to appear younger than his girlfriend. 
After sharing this information with Guy, Ichijo went inside to meet with Kei, who had been waiting for him to wake up for a long time. While waiting for Ichijo, Guy went for a walk in town and was attracted by a flyer advertising sword fights. Intrigued, he went to the venue, which was already packed with spectators waiting for the sword fight to begin. On stage, the host introduced the challenger who would be fighting Midoriko, the sword fighting champion. The crowd erupted into cheers when they found out that she would be competing. Meanwhile, at Kei's house, Ichijo spent time with the woman he loved by dancing together. After accidentally stepping on her foot, they stopped dancing and he helped her to repaint her toenails. Ichijo then asked Kei what else she wanted to do while they were together. She said she wanted to visit a lake that they had often gone to in the past. Without hesitation, he agreed to her request, and Kay happily headed to her room to get ready. At the same time, an automated message on Kay's phone rang, and Ichijo heard that her nurse had advised her not to stay alone because her health condition was worsening. Despite this, they decided to go to the lakeside, and Kay seemed very happy to spend time with the man she loved there. However, she had to return home when she fainted while walking by the lake. In Kay's bedroom, Ichijo saw a wedding dress that she had kept, waiting for him to propose to her. After Kei put on the dress, Ichijo proposed to her as she lay on her bed. Unfortunately, not long after, Kei passed away. Midoriko emerged victorious from a sword fight, only to be confronted by the defeated man in a narrow alley. Infuriated by his defeat, he brutally attacked Midoriko, leaving her bruised and battered. Just then, a mysterious sword appeared and called out to Midoriko by name. She reached out and took hold of the sword and was immediately consumed by an evil force. Overcome by the sword's power, Midoriko began to attack the man who had just harmed her. Guy, who was nearby, rushed over to Midoriko and pleaded with her to stop her violent actions. However, she was completely overpowered by the sword's dark energy and turned on Guy, attacking him with ferocity. The two engaged in a fierce battle, but Guy was no match for the power of the mysterious sword. Just as things seemed dire, Ichijo arrived on the scene and attempted to catch Midoriko with his disc. She was able to dodge the attack, however, and fled the scene. Ichijo then tended to Guy and urged him to leave the area. The scene switches on a cruise ship showing Yasuko Tanaka and her companions were aboard a cruise ship, searching for the treasure of the Thrala pirates. As Yasuko sipped on her drink, a maid approached and informed her that a treasure chest had been discovered. Yasuko eagerly rushed to the chest, but upon opening it, she was disappointed to find that it contained only champagne bottles from a ship that had sunk in these waters. It was not the treasure she had been seeking. That night, Yasuko and her companions gathered to discuss their plans after finding the Thrala pirate treasure chest. Billy and Dick proposed using the money from the treasure sale to set up a farm. The captain of the ship said he would buy a new vessel with his share of the treasure. However, a professor of archaeology who had joined their mission had a different goal in mind. He was only interested in the Gallon's Hammer, a legendary weapon belonging to the Thrala pirates that had been sought after since ancient Greece. The professor explained that the king of ancient Greece had offered a grand prize to the knights who won a tournament and fought bravely in the arena. It was rumored that the winner would also receive a sword crafted by Galen, a renowned blacksmith of the time. However, a knight who desperately wanted the sword came and killed Galen. Galen's son, who was grieving over his father's death, suddenly heard the sound of a possessed hammer calling out to him. It commanded him to avenge his father's death. Determined to fulfill this task, Galen's son arrived at the tournament to confront the knight who had slain his father. Despite his victory, the king treated Galen's son with various poison foods, hoping to acquire the hammer for himself. However, the king was soon possessed by the evil within Galen's hammer and killed his own family members. The following day, Yasuko and her companions finally located the treasure chest they had been seeking, but their joy was short-lived when they discovered that Dick had died. Suspecting foul play, they gathered together to consider who among them could be the killer. Issei Ariga was the owner of a popular salon, known for his exceptional haircutting skills. One day, a journalist decided to cover Issei's life story, bringing even more attention to his talents. As Issei went about his day, he unexpectedly encountered Arnis, a long-haired woman who had murdered his younger sister, Sanaya, in the past. Issei, armed with a gun, fired at Arnis, but the shot did not seem to injure her. Instead, Arnis approached Issei and pulled a Nebastigma sword out of her stomach, stabbing him with it before disappearing. As tensions rose on the ship, Yasuko and her comrades found themselves in a desperate struggle for control of the newly discovered treasure. In the chaos, Billy turned on his own crew, brutally slaying his colleagues one by one. But as he closed in on Yasuko, she suddenly found herself tumbling overboard and into the icy depths of the ocean. As she fought for her life, Yasuko heard the faint call of Galen's hammer, a legendary weapon said to rest at the bottom of the sea. With all her might, Yasuko swam towards the hammer, determined to claim its power for herself. And with the strength granted to her by the ancient artifact, Yasuko returned to the ship and faced down her treacherous crewmate, 
striking him down with a single blow from the mighty hammer. The following day, Yasuko made her way back to the mainland and paid a visit to Issei's salon to have her hair tended to. Little did she know, Mickey and Marcus had been given a secret mission by the Shoshidai to retrieve an ancient weapon known as the legendary halberd. Kyuka filled Yasuko in on the details of the mission, explaining that Mickey and Marcus had been sent to the Sekiya Group Company, where the weapon was being held. It seems that the company's CEO, Shintaro Sekiya, had obtained the halberd from a wealthy merchant. Now, Mickey and Marcus had been tasked with sneaking into the company and reclaiming the powerful weapon. Agent Mina Hirea, Mickey's lover, had already infiltrated Sekiya's company and was posing as Shintaro's nurse. When Mickey and Marcus arrived at the company, Mina provided them with vital information. The halberd weapon was being kept in an underground vault. Thanks to the power of the Azoth sword, Mickey and Marcus were able to turn their bodies invisible and sneak into the vault undetected. However, as they delved deeper into the secure underground chamber, they realized that the vault was layered and they would need a password to open the second door. As the poison gas started to fill the room, Mickey knew they had to act fast. She quickly contacted Mina, asking her to obtain the password for the second door in the underground vault. Meanwhile, Marcus tried to break through the door with his Azoth sword, but to no avail. Mina, who had been caught by Shintaro after he realized she was attempting to steal the halberd, warned Mickey and Marcus of the danger they were in. She informed them that guards were on their way to the underground vault. With this knowledge, Mickey and Marcus knew they had to be extra careful as they tried to find a way out of the heavily guarded safe. The guards searched the underground vault, but Mickey and Marcus had already escaped through a ventilation shaft. Meanwhile, in his study, Shintaro retrieved the halberd weapon from its hiding place and aimed to kill Mina. But Mickey arrived just in time, intercepting the deadly blow and taking the hit to his shoulder. As Shintaro turned to face this new threat, Marcus snuck up behind him, ready to strike with the Azoth sword. The ensuing battle ended with Shintaro's death and the halberd weapon bonding with Mickey, causing him great pain. Despite their injuries, the three agents managed to escape and seek refuge. As Mickey recovered, Mina suggested they return to the Shoshidai headquarters. But Mickey was hesitant to return to the Shoshidai headquarters, as he knew he would be placed back in a cryogenic tube and put into cold sleep. He didn't want to be separated from Mina for an uncertain amount of time. So, before returning to headquarters, Marcus gave Mickey and Mina some time to enjoy themselves at the amusement park. As they spent time together, the demonic power of the halberd weapon within Mickey's body started to grow increasingly unstable. Fearing for Mina's safety, Mickey asked her to stay away from him until he could find a way to control the weapon's power. As Mickey began to transform into a Basoma, Ichijo and Guy arrived to fight against the evil forces consuming him. Though Ichijo was overpowered by Mickey, Guy managed to reclaim his friend's soul and bring him to the Shoshidai headquarters for examination. Upon examination, it was determined that Mickey would inevitably become a Basoma, so he was placed in a cryogenic tube to be frozen. Marcus, who was also at risk of turning into a Basoma, was frozen as well. Both men were placed in cold sleep in order to prevent the transformation from occurring. Back at Amon's house, Sayaka was still struggling with the fact that Guy had to leave. She argued that Guy should be able to live a normal life like any other human. But Guy tried to explain that it was all part of fate, and he had to go where his duty called him. As Guy and Ichijo sat down to dinner, Guy asked Ichijo about his motivations for joining the Shoshidai organization. Ichijo revealed that he wanted to continue living as a human, and that the Shoshidai could help him avoid turning into a Basoma, which would erase his very identity. He reminded Guy that they both had to be able to control the weapons within their bodies in order to protect the people they loved. The next day, as Sayaka was walking home from school, she was approached by Shin Matoba, who asked her to sign a petition. After saying goodbye to Shin and continuing on her way home, Sayaka was confronted by two rough-looking men who were being rude to her. Shin, who was nearby, tried to intervene and protect Sayaka, but was brutally beaten by the men. Just as things seemed hopeless, Midoriko arrived on the scene, distracting the delinquent students and seeming ready to have some fun. But to Sayaka's shock, Midoriko pulled out a sword and killed one of the men, causing the other men to flee in terror. Midoriko approached Sayaka and Shin, still under the sway of the sword's power. She swung her blade at them, but Guy suddenly appeared, using the Shiryu sword to block the attack. Meanwhile, Ichijo was searching for Guy, who had not returned after being sent on a shopping errand. Just then, he was surprised to run into Miyura. When Ichijo called out Miyura's name, the man revealed that his current identity was Zoltguin. Ichijo realized that Miyura had been completely consumed by the evil power of the Zoltguin sword and tried to capture him. However, Miyura managed to escape after Ichijo's hand was struck by an airwave, causing him pain. As Guy continued to fight Midoriko, he was able to wound her, causing her to flee. Afterwards, Sayaka begged Guy to return home with her, but he refused and left her behind, tears streaming down her face. 
The next day, Sayaka was surprised to find that Shin had become her classmate, introduced by their teacher as a new student. At the Shoshudai headquarters, Mina underwent a transformation, taking on a new face and identity as Aya Takagi. She met with Marcus, who had just been removed from the cryogenic tube, to provide counseling. As Marcus and Aya talked, he was shocked to realize that her face was similar to that of a woman he knew named Erika Saiki. He confided in Aya about his fears of turning into a Basoma, but she reassured him that the Shoshudai would do everything in their power to help him. As Ichijo and Guy made their way to the Shoshudai headquarters, Ichijo explained that chrysalises, or people who have been completely consumed by their weapon, cannot be cured. Cases of Sage Alma, or people who have successfully mastered their weapon, and externally crystallized weapons like Guy, are extremely rare. Meanwhile, at school, Shin was quickly making friends thanks to his ability to speak English. However, Nomura and his group disliked him and bullied him during recess. Sayaka, who witnessed the incident, stepped in to help Shin by pretending to report the bullying to the school. Shin was grateful for her help and asked about Guy, who had previously saved her from Midoriko's attack. Sayaka revealed that she saw Guy as a younger brother. Upon arriving at the Shoshudai headquarters, Guy was introduced to Kyoka, who scolded Ichijo for not accompanying Guy back to headquarters after saving him. Ichijo explained that he didn't want to be frozen first because he wanted to save Miura, who had been controlled by the power of the Zoltglin's sword. But Kyoka forbid it, warning that if Ichijo returned to fighting, it would only accelerate his transformation into a Basoma. When Kyoka presented Ichijo's request to fight Zoltguin to the leaders of the Shoshudai, they were unsure if he would be able to succeed. Zoltguin had already defeated many chrysalises and was a formidable opponent. During the meeting, Kyoka received news that a drug capable of turning a Busoma back into an ordinary human had been completed and would be tested on Zoltguin. Just then, an attack on the Shoshudai headquarters was detected, and it was revealed that Miura, now fully transformed into Zoltguin, was the assailant. Several Shoshudai guard troops were deployed to stop him, but Miura easily defeated them and caused chaos within the base. Kyoka, Ichijo, and Guy watched the attack unfold on a screen in the main room of the headquarters. As they watched the attack, Ichijo told Kyoka about his childhood with Miura, explaining that he was a trusted friend despite his lazy appearance. Kyoka admitted that her father had not told her much about Ichijo, but she trusted his judgment. After Ichijo convinced Kyoka that he could save Miura, she granted him permission to fight his father. Ichijo then invited Guy to join him in facing Miura, who was causing destruction outside the headquarters. Together, the two men set out to confront the powerful Busoma. As Ichijo approached Miura, he asked Guy to stay back, knowing that he would need to fight Miura alone. He took out his disc weapon and asked Guy to kill him if he turned into a Busoma. Miura attacked Ichijo, who fought back by throwing discs at him. During the fight, Ichijo was reminded of his past and had a conversation with Miura, who asked about Ichijo's fear of becoming a Busoma. Ichijo told Miura that he was not afraid, confident in his strong mind and determination to fight against the transformation. He even told Miura that if the worst came to pass and he did turn into a Basoma, he would ask Miura to end his life. Miura asked Ichijo what he would do if he too turned into a Basoma. Ichijo replied that he would do whatever it took to bring Miura back to his senses. As Kyoka watched the fight between Miura and Ichijo, she silently begged for Ichijo to save her father. Outside the base, the battle raged on as Ichijo continued to use his discs to defend against the powerful attacks of the Zoltguin's sword. He even began to form a larger disc to finish the fight. However, his strength suddenly weakened, and Miura seized the opportunity to counterattack, sending Ichijo flying. As Miura, now fully transformed into a Basoma, prepared to kill Ichijo, Guy arrived to save him. Using the Shiryu sword still within his body, Guy tried to block Miura's attack and urged Ichijo to accept his help, knowing that he would not be able to fight Miura's power alone. Together, Ichijo and Guy launched several attacks on Miura, causing him to retreat. However, they were then confronted by another Basoma figure named Grimms, and Miura seemed to pay tribute to Grimms, who scolded him for almost losing the Zoltguin's sword. The two Busoma faced off against Ichijo and Guy, their powerful weapons at the ready. Upon seeing Grimms, Guy realized that this Busoma was even stronger than Miura. Ichijo explained that Grimms was the ruler of the Busoma in the world and a very dangerous figure. He asked Guy to leave the fight to him and retreat to safety. However, Grimms praised Ichijo and Guy for their bravery, even though he knew he had far greater strength than them. He then asked them to join the Busoma, but they refused and attacked Grimms with all their remaining strength. The two humans fought bravely against the powerful Busoma, determined to protect their world from the threat of the demonic creatures. As the fight continued, Ichijo noticed that Guy was struggling to resist the evil power of the Shiryu sword. Despite his efforts, Guy eventually turned into a Busoma, his humanity consumed by the weapon's malevolent energy. Ichijo tried to block Guy's attack on Grimm's, but he was hit by the Shiryu sword and a bright light appeared in the middle of the fight. 
When the light faded, Guy was lying unconscious and back in his human form. Meanwhile, a Basoma figure was seen standing in front of him, emerging from the light. And the first season of the anime ends. The moral message of the anime is to fight against the temptation to do wrong and to strive to be our best selves.